Ok, thay đổi. Dạ, yeah, mình thấy đã xét. <laughs> With what you say? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so lecture two. Uh, uh, lecture two, yeah. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do today is let me go back to the uh, kind of table of contents. So, all right, so we define the one in motion last time. So today I want to define basically two integrals. So that's what I'm going to do, all right? So I'm going to define the linear integral and the easy integral and the generalized linear integral. And so that's the end of the lecture. I'm going to discuss um, the so called Ito formula, right? Which basically initializes, initiates, I should say, um, uh, the whole topic of your calculus. All right, so uh, when we stopped last time, let me jump through all of this. All right, so when we stopped last time, is um, we discussed this theory. Essentially, that was the construction for blown in motion. So we discussed the construction of blown in motion. The type is correct. All right. Um, and here we go. Here we go. All right. Um, and so a couple of uh, uh, comments about the properties of Brownian motion. Um, all right. So uh, this is something that I usually prove in my class. Uh, I'm going to give you an indication of one proof here, but basically, uh, one can discuss the regularity properties of the sample parts of Brownian motion. All right. So the probability one. Um, a sample path of blown in motion is going to be further continuous with the quarter exponent gamma, which is less than half. So everybody remembers what quarter exponent gamma is, right? All right, so with probability, uh, that, that happens with probability one. With probability one, the uh, sample paths of blown in motion are nowhere quarter continuous, all right, with exponent gamma greater than half. Uh, it's interesting what happens when gamma is equal to half, but let's skip that. And so the second part tells you in particular that uh, with uh, probability one, the sample parts are nowhere differentiated because if they can't, if they were somewhere, if they were differentiated somewhere, then they would have to be further continuous um, with exponent one, right? They would have to be least continuous. Now, um, so usually the way that this is done, uh, the proof of number two uh, is what I focus on in my class. The proof of number one, usually the classical way to prove it is uh, you employ Kolmogorov's continuity theory. There is a very elegant proof that I'm going to sketch very quickly here that employs employs fractions over the space. So I want to go through that kind of quickly. Um, so I'm going to define these notions. Uh, I'm going to define this operator of the PL. So let R be a real number, right? And F be some function in L2. So I'm going to define this operator. And by the way, by the end of this lecture, you will not remember this operator. So I'm going to define it. All right. But um, I want to convey some basic ideas here. All right, so let's define this uh, high superscript A, all right, to be defined through this integral operator over here with this term. Now, what is this? Uh, right, all right. So, what is it? Basically, what this does is that it generates uh, this idea of integrating n times, all right, for uh, a fractional order for a real number A. So, basically, you take some function there, all right. And then you take the integral of that function up to, let's say, some real number p. All right, so let's say then that you define this as some new function j of p. All right, now if you take the integral of j of p, let's call it j super p1, right? So if you take the integral of that, now we take j super p2 of p. The integral from j of p of j super p1. And it occurs to me. Well, let's say that you do that n times. So you take the integral of the integral of the integral n times. All right. And it's a simple induction to prove that the formula for that, there is a closed form formula for that, is going to be given by this expression where instead of a, you have an integer, you have n, right? So the closed formula would be like uh, j superscript n of p. Would be one over n minus one factorial, right? So that's a gamma function over here that generalizes the factorial. That is that integral, right? The integral from zero to p of p minus s to the n minus one power instead of alpha, right? F of s to s. All right. So basically, by induction, you show that if you integrate n times, then you can integrate, you know, n times, and you can uh, basically obtain 
that n time integral n for d integral by that formula. And then you generalize, you say, all right, so if now I replace n by a real number, so n times some factorial would be gamma of n over here, then I can define this notion of integrating alpha times. All right, that's what we call the Riemann UV uh, integral. And so that allows you to define some, uh, let's call it flux ensemble spaces, in the sense that you say, all right, so now let's take this operator and apply to L2. So for every element of L2, I integrate it 1.5 times. All right, if you have alpha is equal to 2 over here, all right, if you have alpha is equal to 1 over here, or no, you have alpha is equal to 1, what you have to do is you're taking a function L2 and you need to integrate it once. Essentially, what you're saying, you're saying that this space is the space of functions for which the derivative is going to be in L2. In some strong sense, all right, not in some big sense. All right, so we define this space, IA2, to be uh, the space of functions for which the eighth derivative is in L2. Everybody understands this construction, all right? And they were going to define the inner product in this space to be given by the inner product in L2 of the derivatives, all right? So I take two elements in this space. These are generated by corresponding elements in L2. So I take the 1.5 times uh, integral of f and g. All right. So I'm going to define the inner product in this space to the inner product of the derivatives. So if you were doing this with an integral of yeah, integral of order one, all right. So you might think, all right, if I define the norm, don't I need the norm of the function plus the norm of the derivative? But you have some sort of a concave inequality in these spaces. So you know you just focus if you are in a compact space, zero one, L2 over zero one. All right, so you can bound essentially the function by the derivative. All right, so you just take the inner product of the derivative. All right, and similarly, you can define some fractional space uh, where the derivative is empty. All right, you can define it. All right, so that's one way of defining fractional. I was having to come to now the All right. So stay with it, stay with it. That's one way to define a fraction derivative. That's through the Riemann UV, Riemann UV uh, uh, integral. Another way to do it is through some sort of a spectral approach. All right. So this is this is a more common fraction somewhere space. So now we take some function f in L T, and we define basically this integral over here with this kernel over here. What this does, this is of the form. Here, for example, is here. I take some sort of averages for possible S and T. I take some sort, so let's define this uh, S. And let's define this as some new function of uh, some new function of S. Right, so I'm taking, so let's make it a little bit of T, let's say. Right. So I'm taking some sort, this is some sort of averages, right? Of differences with some sort of a can. And so I can define the can this way. So that's a way of defining some notion of fractional derivative to the Fourier transform. So essentially, what I'm doing here, this is basically what you call a Bessel space. So essentially, what I'm doing here, all right, this is this kind of standard field, right? So suppose that you are looking at the L2 derivative of the gradient of some function, all right? So this is you have the L2 derivative uh, square here. Uh, the the mm -hmm. All right. And suppose that you are in one dimension, you can have the derivative. Suppose that you have a first order derivative. If you have a second order derivative, you will give an exponent here n2, right? The third order derivative will give an exponent here 3, right? In this xi, xi. So the idea is that derivatives translate to powers in terms of the Fourier transform. We have. Translate to powers in terms of the Fourier transform. And so, you know, if you have, you know, some power 2n over here because of the exponent n for the nth derivative, then you have to do a single computation and this reduces to this guy. All right, so, so this would be basically the L2 derivative, when L2 takes the transforms, this would be the L2, sorry, the L2 uh, non squared without the derivative. All right, so it would be given by that. And then you generalize for different empty spaces. All right, so that's another um, notion of fraction sobre space. All right, the two are not equivalent. One is defined through the Riemann Human integral, the other is defined through some spectral notion of fraction derivative. We define the norm, this is a separate quantum space. All right, what's the big deal with all of this? Why am I mentioning all of this? Now you can prove, all right, so these are not 
um, equivalent, but you can have these embeddings and you can embed these spaces into other hardware spaces that have a total hardware regularity. All right. So this allows you to prove that the long induction is hardware continuous with a component alpha less than a half with probability one. Why? Well, first of all, you can deal with this space only, but this space is nine because it has its differences. And we find the long emotion to the statistics of the influence. All right. So then you say, all right, you want to prove the problem of probability one, as in here, when beta is less than a half for all p, for all beta less than half, for all alpha less than half, and for all p, it's probability one. In order to do that, I would have to show that this integral is finite, but I'm going to do that only surely with probability one. So all I have to do is to show that this expectation is fine. But if this expectation was infinite, then that would mean that there would be a collection of little omegas for which this trajectory, the sequence of the integral, right, would be uh, infinite with probability one. Right? So I'm assuming here that the expect I'm going to assume that the expectation is finite, which tells me that this uh, integral is going to be finite with probability one. And hence, the only motion is going to be in here, which going to take which tells that it's going to be in here for every p. And you know, every uh, exponent that you can think less than a half, you can exceed as the speed goes to infinity when this guy goes to zero. Uh -huh. right. So this is very nice, right? Because then you look at the increment, you know the statistics of the increment, it's a normal value with variance t minus s. Right. So then you look at the fifth moment of that, right? So you're gonna pass the expectation mean by using the Fubini theory, all right? So by passing the expectation, you're going to look at the expectation of this internet, uh, the, you know, the you know, p, p moment of this guy. But then you use what you know about the internet of the motion. Specifically, if you look at the p moment, right, you know that that internet over there, let me write it as w p minus w there. Right, you know that this is going to be distributed according to zero p minus s. And you know that this guy is essentially p minus s. Uh, all right, so let me take that. This is the p power. All right, so if I take wp minus ws to the fifth power, here this guy is going to be distributed according to p minus s to the one half times a normal value with mean zero minus one, right? That's just from the topics of the problem. All right. So this guy then, I'm going to get the p minus s to the power of p over 2, and I'm going to get the fifth moment all right, of this normal value, and that's going to be this constant over here. Right? So I take this, I plug it up here, and you get essentially the power of t minus s, and you know that this is integral when alpha is less than half. Get that. Right? Now, this is very nice because the exact same proof works for fractional drawing in motion. So fractional drawing in motion, if you have uh, a KST makes greater than a half, and you know that the increments will have positive correlations. And so basically, you expect when you have positive correlations, your process to be smoother. So you're gonna you expect to have higher for the continuity, right? Which you are gonna get from here. You're gonna get from the statistics of the increments. You are gonna have an exponent here which is different than p over two, which is gonna move the whole continuity here. And if you have KST index less than a half. Then you have negatively correlated increments. You expect if you have negative correlation, the process to be moving around all the time. So you expect it to be less smooth, right? And this is what is manifested in this proof because we are going to have here again an exponent here that is going to move the order of continuity uh, to lower powers. All right. So uh, uh, all right. So basically, the idea is that you can safely forget all these fractional subordinate spaces here. But the idea is that there are different ways to define fractional subordinate spaces. And basically, we grab the one that gives us a form of the increments. And then we have the vertex. The vertex, no the subordinate spaces, no matter how you define them, fractional subordinate spaces in one dimension can be embedded into this order uh, space. All right. And that allows us to uh, to prove the further continuity of the long motion. All right, so uh, that was kind of a digression, but I think it's a very good proof, and it saves um, it saves a lot of work when you're working on uh, uh, with flux of the motion. All right, so now let's go back to what we're trying to do. All right, so we have constructed the long motion. We know now that the long motion is not differentiable. All right, I haven't proven that. All right, I haven't proven the second part. But okay, let's assume that uh, we know that. 
This means that every derivative of the Lorentz motion with the path has to be perceived in a weak sense. All right, so uh, the Pascal derivatives don't uh, will not exist with the Lorentz motion. All right, so now we want to formulate this is an equation. All right, which remember this is how we'll be formulating uh, differential equations of the form. Uh, what do I have there? I have F. I have G over there. Uh, and so now we have to define this integral, right? And it turns out that this integral uh, will depend, if you try, there are many ways to try to define that, but of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is, okay, I'm going to define these two Riemann sums, right, somehow. All right, so the first thing that um, you have to notice uh, is that if you try to define these two Riemann sums, that's not going to be a Maspitzes integral. Right? The reason doesn't have to do any, it doesn't have to do with stochastics. Um, we're going to prove that the Lorentz motion has quadratic variation. Uh, it has positive quadratic variation. All right, and I'm going to convince you, just in calculus now, right? This is very simple, no stochastics at all. That if a function has positive quadratic variation, then this integral of the not will find in some sense. All right. So the idea here is the following: Suppose that that's purely calculus. There's nothing stochastic. Then I want to integrate the g against itself. Now we know that this G, if G is differentiable, we know what this integral would be, right? It would be G squared of P minus G squared of A over 2. Right. All right, so, but we are not assuming that G is differentiable because again, W is not going to be differentiable. All right, so let's form some Riemann sum. So let's form the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum. All right, so basically we form a partition. We're going to have a family of partitions. We're going to let the size of the partition go to zero as usual. And we're getting here, we're evaluating the function of the left end points of the intervals in the partition, and here at the right end points of the intervals in the partition. All right. So then you do a little bit of algebra and you compute Rn minus Ln. All right. And this is going to be V sum of this thing squared. The limit of which at the size of the partition goes to zero will be going to the quadratic variation of G. You take the sum of this, it's going to give you a telescopic sum. It's going to be G squared of V minus G squared of L, A. So then you add them, you divide by two, you subtract them, and you divide by two, you take, take uh, you derive the formula for R and LM. And you see that that formula adds what you would expect any to be, one half G square of B minus G square of A, plus this term over here. And this term at the limit, all right, at some appropriate limit, let's say if you define this limit in L2 or whatever, right? So this term in the limit, if this term is greater than zero, you see that the limit of the left sum of the left limit and sum of the right limit the left. The left limit and sum and the right limit and sum are going to be different. All right. Uh, and that has nothing to do with stochasticity. That's just an outcome of the fact that that function G was assumed to have quadratic variation different than zero. All right. So uh, I'm not going to prove it because it's not my class. All right. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. But now um, things become interesting because actually the long motion turns out to have positive quadratic variation. All right. So uh, you don't expect, you expect these integrals to depend. On where you're evaluating, where is the theorem that I want to prove? Okay, it's not this guy, it's not this guy, it's not this guy. All right, so you can very easily prove that if you take the increments of the in motion, you take the sum of the increment squared. And you formulate this sum, and you look at the limit in L2, so you take the L2 norm, these are, of course, random values, right? These are measured functions. Right? So you look this over L2 over the probability space, and you take the difference of that minus B minus A, well, all right? Then that will converge to zero. So this in L2 converges to actually B minus A. So the quadratic variation, that's simple algebra, all right? So uh, you can find, you can go to the page of my um, Plus, and you can actually do that. This is just simple algebra. You formulate the L2 norm, all right? This is the L2 norm squared over here. You do the algebra, and this will turn out to be, um, you take this guy over here, minus B minus A, all right? And this will turn out to converge to zero. So this tells you immediately that you will have problems if you try to define this as a, all right, so, all right, so let's start with the simple case of the integral, all right? So let's see how we go about defining that. So the, the crucial element in defining the integral is um so okay you uh, so 
Right, so the crucial element in defining the Hilo integral would be to actually identify the proper space where this Riemann sums converge. Right, and in order to motivate how we could do that, I will start basically with something that a lot of people could do before the uh, A lot of people could define just by formal integration by part the uh, integral of the function against the own emotion rather than the process against the own emotion. Right, so remember, we want to define the integral of a process against the own emotion. So now assume for the moment that the process is just a deterministic function. All right, so let's simplify our life and assume first. That's not how Wiener uh, uh, defined this integral, but I'm going to define it in a way that is essentially a restriction of the methodology that we use for the ETO integral. So I'm going to introduce the ETO isometry. Then I'm going to use a desk yard. All right, so uh, we're going to define this integral first for uh, integrals, for functions that we want to integrate in C1. All right, and then you say, all right, so um, Brownian motion is not differentiable, so this cannot be written as g times the derivative Brownian motion dt. Right, but we're going to do this formal integration by parts, assuming I mean, if Brownian motion were, were differentiable, then certainly that would be a theory. It's not, so we define it like that. For simplicity here, I'm assuming that g is such that 0, 0 is equal to 0, capital G is equal to 0. Right, so I don't have the boundary terms here, but I could have the boundary terms, it doesn't matter. All right. So if you define that integral through this formal integration by parts, the question now is, all right, so now how do I define the same integral to function g in L2? All right, so I want to basically extend the scope of this integration, right? I can easily define it in C1. And here's where basically uh, the uh, for the isometry comes into play. Now, notice that the way that we define this integral, that's a random variable because w over here is a measure of the function of omega. All right, so basically this guy over here is going to define a random variable. Here we can talk about the expectation and the variance of that random variable. All right, the expectation is going to be zero. The variance, which is basically the uh, L2 norm squared over the probability space, is going to be equal to the L2 norm of the integral squared. So here what you have is an isometry, right? We have two different L2 norms. Here you have the L2 norm with respect to the probability measure of the integral. This is a random variable over the probability space, and it takes the square roots of this, and this is going to be L2 norms. All right, so here you have the L2 norm of the integral. Here you have the L2 norm of the integral. All right, so that's going to be extremely important to define the ETO integral because the way that basically ETO define the ETO integral is everybody was trying to prove that these Riemann sums were converging in some L2 space, in some product L2 space, and nobody could do it. And what ETO did is that he restricted that L2 space. By putting an extra condition that allows you to prove the integral isometry for the integral. Yeah. Now we're defining the linear integral, special case. In this special case, that basically is a lemma, it's a simple lemma. And the proof is very easy, right? The expectation goes as follows, right? So, how do you put the expectation against to be? You say, all right, I want to compute the expectation of this guy, all right, but this guy here is minus this guy over here, all right? I pass the expectation in by to be, all right, what do I have here? I have the probability measure, which is finite, and I have the best the best measure, which is sigma finite. So I can use to be all right. So I pass the expectation in, in the expectation of W of T0 and down. All right. The variance, equally easy, right? So you say, all right, I want to compute the variance. All right, I have in here the product of these two integrals. I'm writing this as a W integral. I'm passing the expectation in by the beginning. I know that the expectation of this correlation over here is going to be the minimum between S and T. Okay. All right, so I have the minimum between S and T over there. So the inner integral, then I decompose. All right, so I have the inner integral from zero to capital T. I write, write it as the integral from zero to lowercase t plus the integral from lowercase t to capital T. Now the integral from zero to lowercase t, I'm integrating with respect to S. Um, if S is less than T, then the minimum between S and T is S. And similarly, the minimum between S and T over here is T, because S is greater than T. All right, so I'm doing the integration by parts here. I'm getting this guy minus this guy. All right, I'm taking t out here, so I have the integral of g derivative, g of capital T is zero, uh, so that's going to give me minus two g of t. All right, so these guys cancel out, so I'm getting this integral over here, integration by parts again, integral g squared. All right, so I'm getting there to norm of the integral. All right, why is this useful? Now, this is useful because this will allow us to basically define the integral in L2. The integral, I guess, yeah, I'm saying now, but imagine that I have a function g in L2. 
I'm going to approximate it by functions, by a sequence of functions in C1. This I know how to integrate against the other All right. All right. So these, I know that this integral over here, right, the end to norm goes to zero because these guys approximate Z. And I can assume, you know, that the boundary have zero here. In N2, the boundary will have measure zero, so it doesn't matter, right? I'm not getting something with complex support. I'm going to get anything in N2. Can be approximated by functions in C10 P where z of zero is equal to z of capital P is equal to zero. All right, with the N2 norm. All right, but I can integrate these things, but I don't have a clue whether the integrals converge. But now here is where the isometry kicks in. It allows you to say that the integrals actually converge because you look now at the N2 norm squared, right? Again, as you have the one half of it here, have the N2 norm, but that's the N2 norm of the difference of the integral of Zm and Zn. All right, by the end of isometry, this is going to be the empty norm of Gm minus Gn. All right, but I know that, that this guy is a convergent sequence, so this guy at Zm and n goes to zero should be going to zero. It should be a Cauchy sequence because it's convergent, right? All right, which tells you that this is a Cauchy sequence, right? In n2, right? Now that's a different n2 space, right? I can also this to this is the n2 space over the back with the back and over zero capital. I mean, this is the n2 space over the probability. All right. Okay, so that's a Cauchy sequence in L2 over the probability space. That's a boundary space, which means that this guy, the sequence of the integrals is a convergent sequence, and we define the linear integral as the limit of the linear integrals uh, of function, functions in C1, uh, C1 uh, with the zero boundary conditions. All right, so this allows us to define the linear integral. So the integral isometry is extremely important, all right, because it allows you to. Uh, basically, use that density argument. You wouldn't be able to use that density argument without the iterate something. Now, the way that Vina defined this integral, so basically, all right, so here's from another book by Curio. All right, he defines it the way that we define it for functions which are uh, in C1. He has the boundary terms here. I took out the boundary terms, right? But then he proves, all right, I'm not going to go through this book. He proves the iterate isometry, et cetera. He extends in and do. But then he, then he proves that this is essentially the limit in L2 of this Riemann sum, where again, this is important, the evaluation of the function is at the left hand point. So, what we do by integration by parts is essentially taking the Riemann sum in L2 and we evaluate at the left hand point. Now, that's how we're going to define the integral. We're going to evaluate at the left hand points. All right. But now there's going to be, uh, we're going to encounter a challenge. All right. So, uh, so we have to define a function, a proper functional space for everything to work. All right. So here is now the historical kind of setting. The historical kind of setting, we didn't have defined the Wiener integral. Uh, everybody knew how to define Riemann sums, so obviously of specific. Um, so everybody could compute, for example, this guy. All right, from zero to capital P. And of course, this depends on how you evaluate the function in the of sum, et cetera. But then everybody wanted to define a general integral. All right. Uh, and everybody was going about it in this product type of space. All right. So the idea was like everybody was like, somehow we should be able to form the sums and basically define the, you know, prove the convergence of these Riemann sums, you know, in let's say this product type of space. So here G is a stochastic process, so you have a function z t omega to several measurability properties, all right? And here what you have, you have essentially the integral with respect to the property space of the integral with respect to the property space of g squared. Take the square root of it. It's going to be the norm in the product space, the back probability measure. Right? So everybody was working in this space. I was trying to prove that the uh, Riemann sums were converging in this space. And um, this is not going to work. Uh, actually, you can show that the Riemann sums in this space don't converge. So what Ito, what Ito did, he defined a new space. He looked at the product type of space with an additional condition. And the additional condition is progressive measurability. So he restricted that space a little bit, and that allowed him to prove convergence of the Riemann sums. All right, and the way, uh, the way he did that is he said, all right, so I'm going to restrict the space, this product type of space, in a way that the Ito isometry holds, and I'm going to use a density argument. So what he wanted to do is that he wanted to say, all right, let's start defining the integral first by step functions. All right, so suppose that I have, you know, a function, suppose that I have a function, suppose that I have a, a partition, 
And I have a function which basically is constant every over every sub interval of the partition. Like this GK over here, though it's on the constant, it's a function variable function of omega. So it's a random step function. Right? Then obviously, you know, I would define the integral through this finite sum. Right? But if I do that in L2, and then I try to approximate arbitrary elements in L2 by step functions, random step functions of that form, I can do that. But I cannot prove that the integrals of these departures are covariant. So instead, you know, what I would like to do is that I would like to impose extra conditions. So again, I have some sort of an isometry that would allow me to employ the density argument. All right. So uh, that's the function the way that is defined. It's again a measure of the function. Right? So it's a random parameter. So if I compute the variance, that would be right the L to non squared of that of that integral, where the L to non is in the probability space. Would be the L to norm squared in the product space. Let's see. So again, the L to norm of the integral is the L to norm of the integral. Right? That's the isometry. We have again two L to norms that are equal, right? That's an isometry. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I got lost when you said when you're restricting L2 of zero T. I haven't done the restriction yet. Yeah. But I just said that some restriction is needed, and I'm trying to motivate now. Okay. What kind of restriction is needed? But what I want to understand is are yeah. you restricting the class of functions G then? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm okay. Doing, right. So everybody was trying, as I was saying, right? Everybody was trying to prove convergence of Riemann sums in this space. And why this space? There is a lot of reasons why we want to do that in L2, right? But basically think of this G of T omega. So you have a stochastic cross of G of T omega. And what you have here, you have the integral, you know. You're saying I'm looking at all processes G T omega. And I have to have certain measurability properties so that the integral that I write it down actually is that the integral of the omega or the integral over, let's say, I'm focusing on the uh, integral over the interval zero capital T, which is T omega, all right, squared, right, in T dt. The square root of that would be the to known in the product space, all right. So everybody was trying to prove the convergence of the Riemann sums in this product L2 space. And that doesn't work, actually, right? And you can see immediately, um, you can see actually why that would fail, not immediately. But uh, what uh, basically what uh, Ito did, he said, I'm going to restrict the space so that the Ito is only holds, right? So if I define the integral of step functions this way, then I would be able to prove this Ito isometry over here. So you see it here, we have the two, uh, the two L2 norms, right? So here we have the L2 norm. Of the integral over the probability space, the square root of that would be the L2 norm. And here we have the L2 norm over the product space, right, of the integral. Okay. And, and the conditions that actually make that work are as follows. All right, let's put the conditions very quickly down. And then, um, so you have to define what is called the um, progressively measured function. All right, so the way that you do it, all right, so let's do it in the framework of a one dimensional drawing motion. All right, all of these are defined over uh, an underlying probability space. So that's uh, the Brownian motion that you constructed last time. So that probability space has to be large enough. It has, in particular, to contain um, an enumerable collection of independent Gaussian and other variables in order for the construction we did last time to work. All right, so I'm going to define the heat of the Brownian motion to be the sigma algebra generated by all W phases for all less up to some time t. So that's going to be the history of the motion up to time t. So these are all measurable events you can talk about based on the trajectory of the Brownian motion up to time t. So we call this the history of the Brownian motion. The future of the Brownian motion beyond t, all right? So the future of the Brownian motion is going to be the sigma algebra generated by all increments of Brownian motion beyond time t. All right, so you're going to see where these are going to come up. So then we define the filtration. The way that I define Brownian motion, I didn't involve any filtration, but now you know, the filtration becomes important. That's actually the point where it becomes important. I'm going to define, in particular, um, the family of sigma algebra, which is going to be called the non it's called a non anticipating collection of sigma algebra with respect to Brownian motion. And this will have these properties. It will be a filtration. All right. For every t greater than s, the sigma algebra of t will be a superset of the sigma algebra of s. So, you know, the information that we get as the trajectory evolves increases as the time evolves. All right. 
Now, the information that we have at time t should include all information in the basis of the belonging motion at time t. All right, so m of t in this situation should be a superset of uh, the heat of the belonging motion at time t. All right, and we're going to impose this condition that m of t is independent of the future of the belonging motion beyond t. Now, why am I looking at the general uh, filtration rather than just the history of the motion? The reason is because we're going to look at stochastic differential equations, and in stochastic differential equations, you might have other sources of stochasticity, right? So the initial condition might be a random variable as well. All right. So uh, we could build the theory only on the basis of the motion without any reference to filtrations, and we would have in the back of our mind the natural filtration, which is a filtration that is generated by the motion. But if we want to include other sources of stochasticity, in order for what I'm about to say to make sense, we'll be working with a uh, more general filtration f of t, which includes right, the natural filtration of the organ, which is generated by the organ. Also. And now, a function g will be called non anticipating. You see now why we use this term, right? Non anticipating, because this information at time t is independent. Of the future of the long emotion beyond t. So you can use that, you cannot use that information to anticipate the behavior, right? Of, of the long emotion. So a process will be called non anticipating, all right? If whatever t is, of t is f of t measured, all right? Or as we say, adapted uh, to this filtration. So this means that this is adapted to this filtration, but then we have extra conditions, right? We have that this filtration is non anticipating, and hence this, um, this definition of uh, the process being adapted to f of t means that basically uh, we call this non anticipated. This is excellent information. And we're going to have an extra condition that is um, a non anticipating process that uh, is uh, jointly measured in the omega is going to be progressively measured. Do you know why we include joint measurability? Does anyone see that? I can tell you after the, uh, uh, you know, but I can tell you after to the rest of you, I can tell you after. All right. So now we define these spaces, which, you know, let's call them board phase L2, which is basically the product L2 space, but now essentially what we're doing is that we're defining some new functional spaces, and right? this board phase L2 will not be just the product L2, it will be the product L2 of progressive dimension. And the same with board phase L1, right? Which I have a typo here, it should be an absolute part, it should be an absolute part, obviously, all right, okay. So now, all right, why does this work now? So now we go through this, Again, all these conditions, you don't have to assume them. You can start with this construction and you will recover these conditions, all right, in order to make the iteration of your work. You say now, all right, so I define random step functions, all right, and I define the integral for random step functions for z, which are progressively measured in any of the product L2, all right. So this means that z of t over that interval of the tier is going to be f of tk measurable. Okay, that is f of tk measurable, all right. So we have this filtration, and this G is adapted to that filtration. The filtration is non-anticipating, so that's jointly measured and adapted to the non-anticipating filtration. All right. And we define the integral now to be what we expect it to be, right? That, that sum of it. All right. But now we can prove the iteration of it. All right. And now we can use a density argument to define this over the product L2 space. Obviously, you can prove that this integral over step function is a linear operator, it's just a sum. All right. So Okay, then you can prove that the expectation is zero. That's not trivial now. That depends on the conditions. That doesn't, if you define this in the, in the product L2 space, that's not going to be true. But it's true because we define it in the subset of the product L2 space, uh, which contains progressively measurable functions. All right, with respect to a non anticipating filtration. And then you have the isometry. And that, the, the proof is just very easy now that we have all the previous layers, right? So the expectation of this guy is just the expectation of this sum. All right. That this GK over here are FTK measured. And these are in the future of long and motion beyond TK, are a sigma plus of TK. And F of TK is independent of sigma plus of TK by definition. So these are variables are independent. All right. And so we distribute the expectation multiplicatively, right? And you get that this guy is equal to zero. That wouldn't hold in the product of space. All right. It's trivial, but it took some degree of genius to actually identify the conditions, right? The similar, uh, the same thing with the ego isometry, right? With the variance. If you look at the variance, the variance, all right, so you have the expectation of this guy squared, that's a sum here, all right, so it's going to be a double sum, sum with respect to k and with respect to j, 
Suppose that J is less than K. All right. So then GK is F of K measured. And everything else, all right. So this guy is going to be F of uh, J measured. All right. So this guy is going to be in the future of PK. So the idea is that all of these guys, this guy, this guy, and this guy are in the history of long and motion, right? Up to PK. So this guy is independent. All right. So you see that if J is strictly less than K, then the non diagonal terms become equal to zero. Right, because you get the expectation of the symptom over here. So the only terms that survive are the diagonal terms. All right, and for the diagonal terms, again, by a similar argument, you get this kind of sum over here, but this is, of course, the variance of the internet of the All right, so you get the expectation now, and you have these GKs, again, GK is a step function, so essentially when you get the unit, the unit is squared. All right, so what's the big deal with that? You get the isometry. the big deal with that now is that you can use it, because now you say, all right, I want to define the integral, for the stochastic process G in that both phase L2. It's a member, again, it's the product L2 of progressively measured functions. All right, so one can prove that I, you can approximate that G by step functions, all right, in the product L2 norm. But this doesn't mean you can integrate these GNs, but this doesn't mean necessarily that the integrals of the GNs converge, right? Everybody was trying to prove in the product L2 that the integrals of GN converges. The integrals of GN converge. But again, what Gotito did is that he restricted the functional space. All right. And he said, all right, in this new functional space that I'm working on, I have the isometry for step functions. So now, if I look at uh, the difference of integrals of different elements of the sequence in L2, in the L2 norm, by the isometry, this is going to be this guy. But, you know, uh, in the product, in the product um, L2 space, GM converges. That was you know, what we assumed here, we use the density argument to approximate G by GF, all right? And so that goes to zero as n and n goes to infinity, which means that this is a Cauchy sequence, the sequence of the integrals is a Cauchy sequence, which means that this is converged to Cauchy sequence. And that's the definition of the integral, all right? So the, the genius of the, the, the big deal somehow with the integral was that, in, uh, I mean, there is, uh, Bina tried to do that, but he tried to do that in L2. So you couldn't put convergence of the renal subs, right? The, the big deal with the Ito integral, the way Ito did it, is that he redefined the, the functional space of interest so that he had the Ito isometry. It's, of course, he wasn't calling the Ito isometry, but he had that isometry, all right? And so that isometry allowed, it's, if you see it under this light, it's trivial, in some sense, right? It looks trivial, right? Uh, yeah. Were people familiar with the notion of Martingale back then, or did this precede that? Okay, so uh, so 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 Ito was not funny. Okay, so the thing that I haven't told you here is that what everybody, all right, so um, what, what people in the Western world were trying to do back then, they were trying to define this integral as a matrix because the Wiener integral is a matrix. Right, that you can prove very easily. The Wiener integral is a matrix. And why would you like this integral to be a matrix? You would like this integral to be a matrix again because you want to prove existence of solutions to stochastic differential equations. If you try to prove the existence of a solution to an ordinary dependence equation, what is the method that you use? You use basically a cell as code, you use a compactness argument. Mm -hmm. It begins to use weak compactness, and the method and weak, weak compactness. So here you have this extra term now, which is an integral. If that integral is a mountain game, then you can replace the uh, convergence argument, the compactness argument, or the weak compactness argument, or cell as code, or whatever. You can replace it by a material convergence theorem. So if you have a priori estimates, if you can bound uh, the, if you can bound the into integral, if you have some a priori estimates here for some for the solution that would come from some bounding over there of uh, uh, of, of the integral, then you can use the hope is that you can use material convergence in a galactic kind of approach, for example, right? So everybody was trying to find this integral as a material. The way that I define it here, this definition makes the integral integral a matrix because I define it in the product L2 space, but that's not how we define the integral nowadays. So that's a historic definition. Nowadays, we don't want to work in this functional space that Ito defined because that's a product space and it's a little bit difficult to deal with. Every time that you work in this space, you have to prove that all the functions that you work in that product L2 space. So instead, you work in L2 over time. And then you define the integral by almost two convergence. Here I proved them two convergence in the product space. But the way that is defined 
you, you work in L2 over time, not on the product L2, and then you try to prove that the Riemann sums converge on Mosuri. And now that, that definition loses the property of Matica. So if you see the legal truth, people say, be careful, the legal is not a market, it's a local market. All right. If you don't lose it entirely, you recover it by a process of localization. But historically, that's a historical definition. And basically, the notes that we before into something make a big deal out of it. Um, although they don't describe the, uh, the definition, right? They don't uh, talk about that a lot. But anyway, so uh, the idea here is that okay, if you do almost supervisors, you use the market property, but then you recover it by some process of localization. You have to pay it as a local market. So it's almost a market. Okay. All right. Uh, any any questions with respect to that? I mean, that's in a sense. It's I, I always hesitate. Now you can put data isometry from functions to the product and two space. All right. So uh, with a progressive measurability condition. All right. So you see you have the two different types of norms here, and you can have basically a property for linear products, corresponding property for linear products, and so forth. Whenever I teach that, I'm always amazing because. Um, in a sense, it's very smart, but in another sense, it's trivial. <laughs> and I don't know if you know <laughs> I don't know how people perceive it, right? So I don't I don't want to make a big deal out of it, but it is a big deal, right? So so uh so I don't know. All right, so um let me just uh pause for a minute here. Okay, you have 10 more minutes and tell you before all right, so now we can start discussing stochastic differential equations, right? But uh let me just pause very quickly. And tell you a little bit, go back a little bit to this definition of white noise, right? Um, if I do that, maybe I can, maybe, maybe I can, well, let's finish this. Okay. Um, let's continue with that. And then, all right, so, um, all right, so the big deal now is that we can actually, um, okay, so, all right, so what I want to do now, I want to spend 10 more minutes discussing, well, let's go back here, discussing the ETO rule. All right, so now we can define stochastic differential equation. All right, and as we said from the very first class, this is going to be interpreted to an integral equation. So we have this formally, so formally we integrate from R to S, we get XS minus X is equal to this difference from S to R, like this integral from uh, R to S, from S to R, what I have, from S to R. Plus this integral from S to R. So the idea is that yeah, if we have yeah. functions in both that four phase L1 and four phase L2, so this means progressively measurable. All right, we will be defining this stochastic differential over here, all right, stochastic differential of X through this stochastic differential equation, which is to be interpreted this way. And now every integral here makes sense. All right. Okay. Uh, and now you can ask questions, well, if I have this stochastic differential, what kind of stochastic differential equations, if I have the stochastic differential of x, what should be the stochastic differential of g of x, like a chain rule, right? Uh, and, and so uh, let's discuss this kind of, so suppose that I have here a simple case that I don't even have a coefficient in front of that stochastic differential of the Lorentz motion. So this has a precise meaning now. So we have defined the equation, right? We integrate that and we take the corresponding integral equation. Okay. All right, so now the question is, suppose that I define a new process, y of t, to be some function of x of t. Well, you can assume that u is as smooth as you want it to be, all right? And the question is, what is the orthographic differential equation should y of t show? Naively, one might say, well, that's essentially the chain rule. So I know that, well, so if, if, if this were differential functions, I would have here d dt of y of t, I would have d dt of x of t, right? So the chain rule would say that the derivative of y is the derivative of u applied to x times the derivative of x, right? Right? So the stochastic differential of x, we know what it is. It is this guy over here. That's formal, right? That, that, that's, that, that's a formal manipulation, all right? So, you would expect this to be the stochastic differential of y of t. But that's actually wrong, right? So the way that we define the integral, integral, that formula, if you interpret it, basically, if you now integrate it, interpret it through the corresponding integrals, that formula would not be true for y of t, all right? And actually, physicists knew that something like that cannot be true before, even before they took, all right? So physicists started using stochastic differential equations with Paul Langevin. They had a heuristic argument. I'm going to present a heuristic argument. 
And that's the only argument the nodes present, but that's not a proof. All right, the proof has to be done in the framework of the partial spaces that we, uh, we determine, right? But the heuristic argument before the flow, again, physics would argue as follows for what should be the stochastic difference of the So physics were view, viewing this as infinitesimal small quantities, of course, right? And so they would say, I have to deal something like y of t plus dt minus y of t. So I'm thinking of y of t plus dt, I can expand, I can take the table of expansion of that. That's a heuristic argument, that's not a proof, right? So now I'm going to wait hands. So you would expect that dy would be u derivative dx plus one half u second derivative dx squared plus the higher order the terms, right? But of course, dx is this guy. Now, if you didn't have the Brownian motion over here, right? You would make that into a rigorous argument in calculus for deriving the chain rule because this time over here we have some delta t squared, and you would want to get the derivative, so you would divide by delta t, you would get delta t squared over delta t, you would get delta t, and delta t equal to zero. This terms, the higher order terms will disappear. But now you have this dw squared, right? And so the w, you know, is basically an increment of the only motion. So for form w of t. Plus delta t for some small delta t minus w of t. Again, that's how physics were thinking of that, right? Again, that's not a proof. But that's a normal random value that's distributed according to the normal random value with variance delta t, right? The, uh, the length of the interval, right? And of course, if you look at delta w squared, uh, if you look at this guy squared, right? If you look at the expected value of this guy squared, we know that that's delta t. Right? So on numbers, if we sample this guy, this small guy, we're going to get something of the order of delta t, which doesn't cancel out. Right? Again, that's a heuristic argument of the physics we use, right? So that becomes like dt, right? So if we if we, if we find the dt terms, we get this u derivative dw term, then of course here you're going to have a cross term, which is going to behave like dt three over two, let's say, and then you're going to have all your higher order terms. Right? The physics of the issue was like, oh, if I divide by a small delta, I call the higher order terms will disappear and I'm left with that. So physics would tell you that that's the correct chain rule. And that's the chain rule that we had before, right? Plus a correction term. All right, so that was this chain rule plus this one half u second derivative dt. All right, so now that can be made into an actual rigorous theory. You can actually prove that. So again, I'm not going to prove that here, but we can go, you know, go through the notes, right? So we can actually say, here's the theory. Suppose that you have a stochastic differential of this form. Again, this means whenever you see something like that, it means that for every interval in zero capital T, for every interval SR, you can get X of S is equal to X of R plus this integral for S integral and so forth. And this is in both phase L1 and this is in both phase L2. Uh, these are the historic spaces, right? Historical spaces. They would be slightly different. All right. Again, we uh, we do almost two conversions of very much sums. All right. But that's how Ito did it. All right. So if we have these assumptions over here, and we assume that this function u, we take the composition now of u with x, and we assume that u is adequately smooth. All right. It has continuous first, first order derivatives and it has a continuous uh, second order derivative with respect to the special variable. And we formulate this composition, then that's basically the interchain rule for that composition. All right, so basically, um, you would get what you would get by normal differentiation u d dt plus u x dx. All right, so this dx you can expand and get the formula below. Plus, this is a collection term. So you have a new kind of calculus now, the chain rule is different. All right. Uh, this means you, you also have a different product rule. For example, the product rule goes as follows, and then you have to prove this, but uh, you know the uh, the nodes uh, follow some sort of a Taylor expansion argument, which is not rigorous, but it's basically what gives people the intuitions. Again, this is a theory now. You can prove this rigorously, right? So if you have two stochastic differential uh, two yeah, stochastic differential equations or two stochastic differentials, all right. Um, again, f and z are in the appropriate spaces, and you look at basically the stochastic differential of x one minus x two again. You would have the normal product rule x2 dx1 plus x1 dx2, but again, when we have an equal correction there, it's in this specific case, it's just the product of the factors of the stochastic differential of the Brownian motion dt. This tells you, this gives you the intuition back from the uh, Taylor expansion, right? 
So this would be the DW terms, but you know, we'll say zero and see if you there. All right. So you have basically you have a whole new uh, calculus. Now, um, if one of these guys, all right, so if one of these guys has Z1 equal to zero, it's equal to zero, then if one, then you recover the user for that. All right. And you can use this formula to show that the into integral gives you the linear integral as a special case. All right. Um, all right, so uh all right so i'm going to read that but basically you can use the product theory to show that the linear integral is essentially to think of this as integration by parts essentially that's what this is integration by parts right mm -hmm. so if you eliminate this term and if one of these terms is dw right so if, if one um okay so let's see let's go up here all right so if one of these guys on the tail is not a stochastic process, but it's basically some function of uh, some deterministic function, which is would be the context of the binary integral, right? Okay, then we get that the, it will get the usual product too. And this will tell you that the into stochastic integral collapses to the binary integral um, uh, in the case where basically these guys are deterministic functions. All right, but that's a theory now, right? So so the binary integral is, is a special case. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. I don't know what do you think, but uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not gonna. The proofs are in my notes here. In my notes, I follow basically the book by Evans. Uh, one, if you give me five more minutes, I want to tell you one more thing um, that actually is something that um, was very well known when Wiener defined his integral. So Wiener defined his integral. So in the sampling notes, in sampling the notes that will be followed by that guy from Princeton, he. Uh, the notes are focused very heavily on that Lanzerbein equation, right? So we're going to have a stochastic differential equation of the form, you know, minus, uh, it's going to be some derivative of some potential, something dt, some derivative of some potential, plus some constant term, I don't even remember, I think we do this one half, something dw. So in a sense, for what we'll be doing for the rest of the semester, we don't really need the integral integral because it's going to be formulated in terms of the linear integral. Right. But there will going to be occasions in the notes where the author will be using um, the integral that will be hidden because it, he will be using the formula. All right. Even though he doesn't pay attention to the eta integral, but he will be using the formula. The formula is that same as what we have. All right. He will be going to basically stochastic differential to until you have a process. That's kind of uh, hidden. The other thing that I want to say. Um, should I take five more minutes or not? Should I talk to you? Or I just talk to you? Probably. Yeah. yeah, okay. So let me take five more minutes. Uh, so this, since this book was mentioned by Legal, all right, so I want to motivate this definition that he has of white noise. All right, so, um, uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about distributions very quickly. And that's something where basically it was done immediately after being and defined the Sorry. All right, so, um, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, notes. All right, so uh, let me define you the notion of the distribution. So suppose that we have a function which is locally uh, integrated. It's an L1 local over some domain. So let's make this, it could be, let's focus with that. All right. So there is this notion of distribution as parts. For every such function, we can define uh, a linear operator, which we lack for the test function, pi, for the motivated distribution. And basically what this does, it gives you a local average of f. All right, so we take the integral over r of f of x, pi of x, where pi is what we call a test function, is in c infinity zero of r, all right. So we define this linear operator for every f, which is locally integrable. We define this linear operator, which acts on test functions, right? C infinity zero, all right? And basically it takes a local, uses, uses this as a flow, all right? As a test function, as a flow, to give you back a real number. The real number is gonna be a local average around the support, the compact support of that function of f. So the intuition here, I mean, this class was, you know, it's actually, it was actually pretty good. Uh, the physical intuition is that, all right, so the classical view of a function, suppose that you have, you know, a metal rod and you want to measure temperature in this metal rod, right? The, you know, the, the classical way of 
um, representing temperature would be for every x, we put this around on an axis, and for every x, we have f of x, which represents the temperature of that load. But what the physics do, he comes with a thermometer. All right, so that thermometer has a profile, has a compact support. All right, that thermometer takes some local average of the temperature. All right, so essentially the act of measurement is the action of a linear operator on the test function. And of course, then you don't actually have to have a function, you can generalize that, right? You can define a distribution. This is a linear bounded function or a bounded linear function um, of a simplicity is zero depending on the uh, on the uh, topology that you use for C infinity zero, but I'm not gonna go there, but you can define a distribution to be an element of the dual of C infinity zero. Right? So every bounded linear operator, you perceive it as some local average success. All right. So now, of course, if you here is how you define the weak derivative there, right? So the weak derivative, so the derivative of a distribution, right? If f happens to be differentiable, of course, right? That would be tf, tf derivative of pi. So now we start with the derivative. We use a test function to prove that the derivative by integration by parts, right? That would be minus r of pi derivative of x, f of x dx. Right? It would be phi f derivative integrated by the function, have compact support, so there is no bound boundary and so forth, right? And that's our definition of the derivative of the of a distribution, right? The derivative of a distribution is minus the distribution applied to the derivative of the test function. So we don't have to worry about whether f is definable or not, right? It's in an animal local, and that's now defined, that's a proper definition in the dual of C infinity zero. All right, so you can play once you have the binary integral, right? you play the exact same game with the binary integral, right? You can define the weak derivative of Brown in motion, right? But now there's going to be new ingredients. And I want to, I want you to be able to understand this definition of appearance in the middle, right? So now you say, oh, I said, here's what I'm going to do. All right, I'm going to define, all right, the distribution. Remember the first, we use psi for white noise. I'm going to define the distribution that takes us into um, a test function, and the idea is that I want to get some local average of white noise. All right, so that basically we should get by taking some weak derivative of Brownian motion, right? By the arguments that I had in the first lecture, right? Because in the first lecture, we're thinking of Brownian motion as some sort of an integral of white noise. All right, so this tells you that this should be the integral over R of, uh, sorry, the derivative. This would be minus the integral. Like the definition of weak R, right? That should be the minus the integral of um uh, well, yeah, we'll motion of pi derivative. Right? <laughs> minus um uh, let me write it explicitly. So that would be minus the integral, and I do the integration by parts, right? Pi of t. If the only motion was differentiable, that would have dw of t dt. But it's not differentiable, so we have a bit of integral. All right. Which we know what this is, right? We know that this is minus minus is going to give me, um, uh, this is the minus of t dt. Zero. So minus minus when I give the plus, we get pi derivative of t w of t dt. Everything up now is obvious, right? I'm just using the definition. So people were defining random distributions like that. All right. All right. But now what's the big deal? So the big deal now is that we have a random distribution that represents white noise. All right. But that's that's essentially a bit integral. So for this, we have the isometry, right? So we know. That the um, if I look at the uh, L2 norm, L2 norm of that random distribution over the probability space, so that's that's for a specific phi, it gives me it's a real value for a specific phi, phi that, that I get the real number, but it's a random variable, right? So I can get the L2 distribution of that, the L2 norm of that uh, random variable over. A specific phi over here over the, the probability space. All right. So I know by the isometry, all right, that this is going to be 
uh, the uh, Elbidon for five. All right. And now, of course, I can define this not only for phi and C infinity zero, but I can define this in L2. All right. So that motivates this definition. All right. So which is basically this definition came about historically if after the Wiener integral. So I went through that very quickly. Let's see. And I'm trying to do that because I got five minutes, but that motivates uh, this definition. All right. So forget about this measure of this space and mu over here. So for that, for us, this is the real line. All right. And mu is the Lebesgue measure. All right. We define white noise to be an isometry from L2. So it takes us input test functions, right? It takes us input the test function. It gives you as output a Wiener integral. Now, the Wiener integral, you can prove that it's a Gaussian random variable. So the output is a random variable. In a centered Gaussian space. Why centered? Because the expected value of the real of the integral is zero. And this mapping satisfies the isometry, right? So white noise would be an isometry from L2. We could define it from C infinity zero, but of course we extend it by a density argument, right? It's an isometry from L2 into a centered Gaussian space, so it's a random variable, right? That satisfies that the L2 norm of G. All right, Z again is a mapping from L2, right? So it applies to functions in L2, right? But that guy over here is going to be the Riemann, the Riemann, the Riemann, the right? So this is the integral, exactly, right? It's modeled by the integral, right? The variance of the integral is the variance, is the variance of the integral. The, the, sorry, the variance, the uh, L2 norm of the integral is the L2 norm of the integral. All right, that's exactly what is modeled by this situation. So that's the acceptable definition of white noise nowadays. Remember how I defined white noise in the previous lecture, I defined it in engineering way, right? And we proved that that kind of white noise doesn't actually exist, but the way that it's defined nowadays is essentially as a random distribution. And you know, here we have even dropped the linearity, right? Um, other offers actually also impose the linearity, but here the offer focuses only on the isometry part. All right, so I hope, I hope this kind of um, this kind of makes that definition understandable. Yeah. Is the motivation for uh, free Gaussian field? That's a different, uh, yeah. You can think of this as a Gaussian field, but three Gaussian field is another thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. A three Gaussian field. That uh, goes in a different a slightly different direction. Oh, yeah. All right. A Gaussian field generalizes the notion of a Gaussian process in the sense that basically now instead of having a batch of random values indexed by time, you have a batch of random values indexed by vectors. All right. And then uh, three goes and three is uh, something else uh, entirely. But um, you can think of this as a Gaussian field parameterized by L2, by an infinite dimensional space, right? So you can think of this as a Gaussian field, but the three goes and field is something uh, slightly different. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's a good place for me to stop. Yeah. Uh, why did Guido define the integral using 